Hello, my name is Yu Hongzhong. I'm a first year PhD student in computer science at Columbia University. Today, I'm going to talk about our work, XRP, Incredible Storage Function with eBPF. This is a paper we published at a system conference, OSDI 2022. With new storage technologies, storage devices are getting much faster. As a result, kernel software is becoming a bottleneck for storage. Let's take a look at the breakdown of the average latency of a random 512 byte read, which shows the percentage of time spent on hardware and kernel software with different type of disk. Here, kernel software means the storage stack inside the kernel. We can see that a higher percentage of time is spent on kernel software when the storage device is faster. Kernel software overhead account for around 50% of read latency on the second generation of Optin SSD. So what is the kernel software overhead? Let's take a look at the data pass of one typical read request. When the application submit a read request, they first need to cross the kernel boundary and reach the syscall layer. After that, the request will be sent to the file system and the block layer, and is then forwarded to the NVMe driver. The NVMe driver then sends the request to the storage device. Once the read request is completed, the response is returned to user space in reverse order. Here, the percentage of time spent in storage device represent the hardware overhead, and the rest are the kernel software overhead. OK, now we know the composition of the kernel software overhead. But the question is how to eliminate this overhead. One extreme way to do that is to bypass the kernel entirely. Kernel bypass is a popular topic in academia. There are many exciting works such as Demi Kernel, Shenango, and Snap, which build kernel bypass system for storage or network applications. In industry, the most common library for storage kernel bypass is SPDK. Kernel bypass configures the storage device to be managed by user space and disable its interrupt. The user space application can then communicate with the storage device directly without using any syscall. By eliminating all of the kernel software overhead, the read latency can be reduced by up to 49%. However, kernel bypass is not a panacea. It is true that it does not incur the overhead of the kernel storage stack, but using kernel bypass also means that there is no fine-grained access control because any process can access the device directly. What makes it worse is that it requires busy polling for completion since the interrupt of the storage device is disabled. That means processes cannot yield CPU when waiting for I.O. It has two further implications. First, CPU cycle are wasted when I.O. utilization is low. Also, CPU cannot be shared efficiently among multiple processes. OK, kernel bypass doesn't fit the need for people who need isolation and want to use CPU more efficiently. Since isolation and resource scheduling are two key services provided by the kernel, the question then becomes how to reduce the kernel software overhead without bypassing the kernel. Notice that the NVMe driver itself only accounts for 1.8% of the read latency. If the application can offload an eppf function into the NVMe driver, to submit read request and process read response, then we can potentially reduce the read latency by up to 47%, which is very close to the speed up achieved by the kernel bypass approach. Let's look at an example to see how offloading eBPF function into the kernel can reduce the kernel software overhead. Many popular key value stores use B plus tree as their own next data structure. Without eBPF functions, a B plus tree index lookup consists of issuing multiple I/O requests to traverse the B plus tree from the user space. Initially, we are at the read node. We need to issue the first read request to fetch the read node from disk. The read request needs to traverse the entire kernel software stack to reach the storage device, and the data needs to be sent back to user space. The application would then parse the data to determine whether we arrive at the leaf node. If not, we will extract the offset of the next node to fetch. 
Since we haven't reached a leaf node yet, the application will issue another read request to fetch the next node. The new read request will traverse the entire kernel software stack again, and the response will be returned to user space. The application will parse that node again and finds that this is still not a leaf node. Therefore, a new read request will be issued to fetch one of the children of the current node. The new read request follows the same data path. And finally, when parsing the data, the application finds that this is a leaf node and can finish the lookup. Here, we see that node parsing and IR request submission are performed in user space, which means we traverse the full kernel software stack multiple times. Now we show how offloading EPPI function into the kernel can help B plus tree index lookup. Assume that the application can offload an EPPI function to the MVME driver. We still start from the root node and issue the first read request to fetch the root node. The first request will cross the kernel boundary and traverse the submission path of the entire kernel software stack. However, when the first read request is completed, instead of returning the data all the way back to user space, we can call the EPPF function right at the MVME driver. The EPPF function will parse the data and submit the next read request directly to the storage device. This is also the case for the second request. When the third request is completed, the EPPF function finds that this is a leaf node and returns the leaf node to user space. Here, we only traverse the full kernel software stack once and reduce the latency of intermediate I.O. by up to 47%. We call a sequence of such I.O. requests as a chain of dependent read requests. We find that chain of dependent read requests are very common in storage applications. B-tree and LSM tree, including their variant, are used as the only index in most of the storage engines. They both issue dependent read requests to perform lookups. Therefore, we want to build a framework for storage engines to accelerate dependent read requests using internal function. To achieve this goal, we build XRP, a framework for internal storage function with eBPF. XRP allows application to offload eBPF functions into the kernel. When the application initiates a chain of read requests, the eBPF function can then be called to parse IR response and submit more requests if necessary. Only the final result will be returned to user space. We can use XRP to accelerate many different types of operations, such as index lookup, range queries, and aggregations. eBPF is already widely used in networking. For example, it can be used for packet filtering, packet forwarding, packet tracing, and network scheduling. In these networking use cases, an eBPF program can operate on each packet independently. However, on the contrary, a storage eBPF program needs to traverse a large on its data structure in a stateful way. This is not an easy problem. XRP is the first system that adopts eBPF to reduce the kernel software overstack for storage. To adopt eBPF in storage, we address the following research challenges. Since this is a short presentation, I'm not going to cover the solution to all these challenges. Instead, I will show how to write a storage eBPF program in XRP. Here, we present a simple eBPF program for B plus tree index lookup. The eBPF program needs to parse the tree node fetch from disk and submit the next request until it reaches a leaf node. A context is passed to the eBPF program as the parameter. It has the pointer of two buffers. The data buffer stores the data that was fetched from disk, and the scratch buffer is provided as a private scratch space for the user space application and the eBPF program. The scratch buffer can be used to store lookup parameter or intermediate state. The, net, the kernel will never touch the scratch buffer. The data buffer contains the B plus tree node that is going to be parsed. 
the search key is stored in a spread buffer by the user space application so that it can be used by the eBPF program. The function first checks the type of the current tree node. If this is a live node, it can return the result to user space without submitting more I.O. requests. Otherwise, this is an internal node, and the function needs to search for the next node to fetch. The fan out field will record the number of children in the current node. We can linearly search all the pivots to find the next node. Here, max fan out is used to ensure that this for loop is always bounded. Without it, this program will be rejected by the eBPF verifier. After finding the child node in need, the eBPF program extracts its address from the current node and specify the next request in the eBPF context. This is just a very simple example. In fact, BPF can traverse many types of data structures. We we'll integrate XRP with two key value stores. The first one is BPF KP, a simple B plus three key value store we built to take advantage of fast storage devices and XRP. It allows us to test the performance limit of XRP. We also integrate XRP with Wild Tiger's LSM tree. Wild Tiger is a popular key value store and is part of MongoDB. By integrating XRP with Wild Tiger, we show that XRP can accelerate the production key value store in YCSP workload. To see how well XRP works, we evaluate it in different ways. Due to the time limit, I will focus on the first two questions in the evaluation. What is the performance benefit of XRP? How does XRP compare to kernel bypass? You can find the answer to the other questions in our OSDI paper. To study the performance benefit of XRP, let's look at the multi-threaded throughput from BPFKB with uniform random 512-byte read. The x-axis is the number of threads, and the y-axis is the throughput. Note that we use six CPU cores for the evaluation, which is shown by the vertical gray dashed line. Compared to read syscall, XRP can double the throughput of BPFKB. We can also see that XRP can scale well, even if the number of threads exceed the number of cores. This is because XRP alleviates the CPU contention by reducing the CPU overhead per IO request. To see how XRP compared to kernel bypass, the performance of SPDK is added to the throughput graph. Here, this multi-threaded experiment approximates a multi-tenant environment where each thread represents a different storage application running on the same machine. We see that when the number of threads does not exceed the number of cores, SPDK always achieves a better throughput since it doesn't incur the overhead of the kernel storage stack. However, SPDK fails to scale beyond the six threads because SPDK threads cannot yield CPU when waiting for IO to complete. To sum up, XRP provides performance that is close to or even better than SPDK without sacrificing isolation and CPU efficiency. We also measure the tail latency in the multi-threaded experiment. The x-axis is again the number of threads and the y-axis is the 99.9% tail latency. The green dashed line shows the number of CPU cores. Similar to the throughput result, compared to using read syscall, XRP improved tail latency of BPFKV by up to 45%. We can also see that tail latency of SVDK spiked to around 10 milliseconds, where the number of threads is greater than the number of cores by more than 50%. In summary, XRP is the first system to use eBPF to accelerate common storage applications. Also, XRP captured most of the performance benefits of kernel bypass without sacrificing CPU utilization and access control. XRP is an open source academic research project. You can find more details in our paper. If you have any question, you can reach me by email. Thanks.